Good morning, everybody. Why don't you guys go and stand up with us? Let's pray and jump into a time of worship. Well, Lord God, we do thank you. Lord, we praise you for this time. Lord, this opportunity that we have to be able to come worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we pray and ask, Father, that you'd have your way among us. God, we pray and ask, Lord, that you would allow this time, Lord, to be, Lord, glory to your name. Lord, we lift high the name of Jesus here in this place and this time. So, Lord, would you have your way? God, would you be praised? Would you be high and lifted up? God, we pray and ask, Lord, with all the stuff going on in our hearts and our minds, all the things happening in our world around us, Lord God, all the things that are keeping us distracted from you, Lord, this morning, Lord, we surrender them all to you. Lord, we come and lay them at your feet, Lord God. Lord, to you be all the glory here this morning. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. All glory to you, Lord.
Lord God, we thank you. We worship you. We praise you here this morning. Lord, with all the stuff happening in our own hearts and our minds, Lord God, Lord, how good and how great it is. Lord, we come together, brothers and sisters in Christ here this morning, to worship you because you are worthy. Lord, not because we have done something or have something to add to you, but Lord, we cast all our cares before you here this morning. Lord, that you might be the center, the focus of all things in our hearts and in our minds here this morning. Lord, to you be all the glory here this morning. In Jesus' name. Ten thousand reasons 
Such boundless grace, the God of ages, stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, He's the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. How great, how awesome you are, worthy to be praised, King of kings, Lord of lords. Lord, to you be all the glory here this morning. Praise your name. Praise your name, Lord God. Lord God, we pray and ask that you would draw us near here this morning. God, we pray and ask, Father, that we would be found in a place where we're able to receive all it is that you have for us. Lord, that our hearts and our minds, Lord, wouldn't be distracted or tainted by this world, Lord, but we'd be able to stand before you perfect, spotless, righteous, holy sons and daughters of the Most High. Not because of what we've done or accomplished, but because of that precious blood of Jesus. Because that sacrifice you gave giving your only begotten son for us that we might have access to the Father. What love, what grace, what unmerited favor. Thank you, Lord God. You are good. Draw us near, Lord God. Pour out your spirit.
lay it all down again to hear you say it on my desire No one else will do There's nothing else can take your place You feel the warmth of your Help me find the way Bring me back to you Lord, that you would be our only desire here this morning. Our only hearts cry. Praise you, Lord. And sing that out. We, you're all we want. You're all Us know you are near. Yes, Lord God. Let's just take a minute where we're at right now. And in groups of three or four, let's just take a minute and pray that prayer in our own hearts and our own minds. Pray for each other, encourage each other with that desire, with that heart, and that prayer to pray that the Lord would be all to us, our center, our focus in this morning. Take a few minutes for that.
Amen, amen. Why don't you guys go and stand up and greet those that are around you, and the kids can be dismissed to their classes. Why don't you say hi to at least five people you have not said hi to yet this morning.
<clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. I want to go over some announcements. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, I was feeling, uh, what is it, reminiscent? Is that, is that a feeling or is that a, something that happens? Ah, thank you, sir. I was feeling, I am an ESL success story, but sometimes um, I, I am limited. <laughs> but uh, I'm feeling nostalgic today um, because I have some uh, old youth group guys that used to uh, be with me in a youth group way back in the day, many, many moons ago. Um, Stephen flew down just for this service, so it's exciting, yeah? <laughs> um, Edward's here, which is cool. Uh, yeah, it's good, man. It, it's, it, feels, it feels funny. Uh, and then I have some new youth group kids uh, in here, some, some, some new ones. I'm going to have them come on up. No, I'm just, just kidding. <clears throat> but yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a funny day. It's a funny moment. Um, let me go over some announcements. Um, Bill is, uh, Pastor Bill is not here today, and so uh, you guys will have to contend with me today. Um, but before we get to the word, I want to go over some announcements. Uh, the main thing is there will be no midweek service this Wednesday. Uh, <clears throat> Thursday is Thanksgiving, and so we want to give you time to get your, cook, your cooking out of the way, get the turkeys ready, and be uh, either traveling or preparing for those who are traveling to you. Uh, we do uh, hope and pray you have an awesome time. And uh, it's a great opportunity. You know, Thanksgiving, uh, it's in the name. So it's a great opportunity for you to be able to share with your family what you're thankful for and uh, we, I think we spend a lot of time talking about things we don't have. Um, as a society, um, as people in general, you know, we can, we can spend a lot of time complaining about things we don't have. Um, I would say if you're a whiner by nature and a complainer, put that on pause for Thanksgiving, for Thursday, and allow your family who is used to hearing you complain Allow them the blessing of hearing you be grateful. That would be a, that would be a twist in the story, you know? Um, <clears throat> they would be looking at each other thinking like, man, Sammy's always complaining about everything, government and cars and shoes. But he, today he said he's thankful for the work that God has done in his life, for God's faithfulness, for God's provision, and so that, that they would hear you proclaim the goodness of God, that is a great opportunity that we have <clears throat> for Thanksgiving. So um, be sure to do that. Be sure to be uh, prayed up and ready to do so. Um, the women are having a Christmas dessert. The flyer looks like this. They're doing ticket sales um, out there today. So make sure that you um, pick up a ticket for yourself ladies and for a friend. Uh, make sure that you invite uh, friends to it. It's always a, a really cool time. Um, I know my wife is always blessed. My daughter's been there for several and um, it's just a good opportunity to get together. And I would say be encouraged and filled and ready, uh, you know, before all the crazy drivers and crazy people hit the stores <laughs> for, <clears throat> for the commercial side of Christmas. Uh, we want to make sure that you're all ready for just that reminder of what it is that we are celebrating uh, during the Christmas uh, holidays. 
We will be decorating the sanctuary, the Spanish chapel, the kids' building um, next Sunday. So if uh, you want to be here and you want to be um, helpful and contribute to that, you have a ladder, bring it. You have a staple gun, uh, bring that. And uh, bring yourself if you want to bring some cookies or some uh, hot chocolate or something to share. Um, maybe you can't get up on a ladder and do a lot of things, but you can make some cookies. Bring the cookies. Uh, everybody who's going up and down the ladders will be blessed to buy it and be happy to have you here as well. We'll have some music going and be able to uh, work alongside each other and uh, decorate the place. Last thing, <clears throat> before you guys open your Bibles to James, um, the last thing I want to say is uh, when you get home or for those of you who are online listening, make sure that you're liking the, um, the broadcast. Make sure that you're clicking likes and thumbs ups and happy face emojis and whatever it el else uh, you do. Um, every time you do that, <clears throat> excuse me, and every time you share the link, um, it I'm not a computer guy, but it, it moves up in the algorithm. More people see it. Um, it. It forces itself upon others that you know. <laughs> so uh, for every pointless video that you see because it pops up on your feed because your friends are watching dumb things, this will be a video that they see. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, be sure to do all of those things. So that people know what you're up to, all right? That concludes our announcements for today. Um, so today's message is called Turning Trials into Triumphs. And um, I wanna talk to you guys about the book of James. We're not going to do the whole book. Um, we're, gonna look at, we're only gonna look at the first few verses there, but... Uh, Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would be <clears throat> honored um, as we open up your word. We ask, God, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive from you all that you have for us today. We would hate to come here and to gather with your people and just leave with some social interaction whether it was an encouraging social gathering or a discouraging one because people didn't meet my needs, that would be so sad. Lord, we wanna to come to meet with you. We wanna to come to hear from you. And Lord, we ask that you would speak into our lives, that you would change us from the inside out, that we would be ready, God, to go into this world and be impactful. And so we yield ourselves to you and to your word this morning, and we ask, God, that you would move in us and through us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Before we get into James, I wanted to just lay some groundwork for what we're going to be discussing today. The book of James uh, was written to address a lack of maturity in the believers that were there. And so um, it's a very practical, it's one of my favorite books because it's very practical. It's like, hey, here's a problem, fix it. Here's another problem, fix it. Um, I like that approach. And uh, the, the whole book of James is, is pretty much written in that way. And uh, the main focal, the focal point of the book is dealing with maturity, allowing maturity to grow allowing and challenging immature or underdeveloped Christians from growing and developing and being strengthened and being mature. And so it may be, a, I don't know, maybe an uncomfortable topic for you today because you like to be immature. Um, maybe it's going to be an encouraging topic for you today. I hope that it can be both. Uh, I do not mind making you uncomfortable if you are lazy and immature. Um, I think it's a good thing. 
I think it's a good thing to be uncomfortable when we are that way, to break out of those um, bad habits. As I was preparing for this message uh, about a month ago, uh, I was reminded of a time that I went to visit a friend. Uh, I went and I, I knocked on their door. I don't even remember why I was going there now. It's been so long ago. Um, but as my buddy opened the door, we were talking about whatever we had to address. And in the background, I see this little naked baby just run across the background. And I was like, okay, we're talking here. And I see this little, little streaker. And I thought, that's weird. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, the little kid's running to go get some clothes on. Nope. Because there he goes again. Just ran right across the background again. And I, finally, I was like, hey, listen, there's a naked kid running around your house. And uh, my buddy very nonchalantly just said, like, well, I, you know, we're potty training and, you know, he's having a hard time. Uh, so we decided to go with this strategy. And all I could think of was like, well, it works for my dogs, you know. <laughs> when the dog stops, you're like, hey, get outside. <clears throat> and so that's what they were doing. They were potty training their um, toddler. And uh, it was a strategy of, you know, as soon as he stops, we know something's going on. You know, so they would grab him and take him to the bathroom. Um, I didn't have to do that with my kids. Uh, but... Raise your hand if that was done in your family. Naked baby. All right, because here's the thing. He tells me, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, this is like, this is one of the methods. <laughs> and I was thinking, I don't know, man. I've never heard of that. And you guys just proved it today. Um, this was years ago. It was cute. It was funny. It was humorous. You know, and it's socially acceptable for babies to have accidents, for babies to poop in their diapers, for them to explode out of their diapers, you know, it, all of those things are okay because what? Well, they're age appropriate, right? It's age appropriate for babies to have these problems. Now, I want to share another story with you. I was hanging out with a buddy and <clears throat> he sees this guy at, uh, at the store where hanging out together and he sees this guy and he, he just nudges me really hard. He's like, dude, that guy. And I said, what about that guy? He says, so when we were in high school, we were skateboarding and uh, we left school and we were skateboarding to go to a park to skateboard some more. And this guy had to go to the bathroom and we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to the park. You can go there. And we're skating and skating and skating. And next thing you know, he's skating ahead of me. And I see that he has poop running down his legs because he was wearing shorts. <clears throat> so this was like sophomore year. They called them poopy shoes. The rest of high school. And even after we saw him, like we were already like college age and we saw this guy. He's like, dude, that's poopy shoes. And he tells me this story. Not cute for a high schooler to have that problem. It's funny and hilarious and it's, you know, joke worthy and it's something that they mocked this kid forever because of this. <clears throat> Why? Not age appropriate, right? He, he, he should have been able to keep it together uh, and, and get to the bathroom, right? This was an unfortunate thing. Here's the thing about this. There are uh, poopy characteristics in all of us that sh we should have matured past. Yes? But unfortunately, and I don't really understand why, but some people don't mature past certain behaviors, attitudes, and mindsets. And so they're stuck. They're stunted. They're unable to get past these things. A lot of the reason for this is an unwillingness to yield to 
difficult things and grow through them. A lot of people, when something difficult comes, they're out. They just disappear from the scene. And so you end up underdeveloped. You end up unable to problem solve, troubleshoot, and honestly just grow some thicker skin and learn something that's called perseverance and just persevering through the difficulty rather than hitting the parachute and just leaving. And it's unfortunate, it, it always baffles me and it kind of breaks my heart when I, when I meet adults, grown men and women that are my age or older and they're still wrestling through these, I don't know, social struggles or maturity defects. And, and I think, man, it's so sad and heartbreaking. They should have outgrown this already. One of these things that you can see often is, you know, a teenager in high school, for example, what will they say about school and high school and your teacher and English class or history? You ask them, how did it go in school? Or, you know, let's say it's review time, right? And you have the grades and, and, and it's a bunch of bad grades. The natural reaction for most teenagers, oh, well, that teacher hates me, right? For English. And as a parent, you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, they're all human. What happened in history? Oh, well, you know, that guy has it out for me. That's why I got a bad grade. And then PE? Well, yeah, he's racist. That's why. And, you know, what about science? Oh, well, he didn't like my shoes. And after a while, a good parent would say, okay, listen, the common denominator in all of these classes is you. So I'm going to go with, you're probably the problem. And so a slap, you know, behind the head, a reality check would bring someone back into that place where now you're doing some self-inventory. Is it possible that everyone hates me in every class? It's not likely it's probably an immaturity in your mind making up this drama when in reality, you're making a big issue over nothing. You need to suck it up and do the assignment and you need to show up into that teacher's classroom and understand that's their world. You're passing through their world. They're in charge. So you pay attention, show up on time, do the assignment, I am not a very intelligent person academically, okay? I, well, so that's not really the right way to say it, but that proves my point. <clears throat> I would say I'm a smart guy. I would say academically I struggled. That sounds better. And so I struggled academically, but you know what? I ended up graduating high school with a B average. Not bad for me. I struggled all the way through it. <clears throat> didn't come easy to me. But I knew that, I knew this. If I just showed up, didn't talk back, did the assignments, even if I bombed most of the tests, I didn't actually learn anything, I'd still do okay. <clears throat> when I came to my mom and I struggled with something, she didn't say, oh, mijo, it's because he doesn't like you. No. It was like, off came the chancla, and it was like, what did you do? <laughs> I, we learned early to take ownership of what's happening in our lives. An old friend of mine, some of you may know him, his name was Dave Hunt, <clears throat> and um, years ago, I met him. He, he, in his younger days, struggled with drugs and um, being in the wrong crowd, and he ended up in, in jail several times and in prison. And I met him, and he says to me, you know, man, you know, everywhere I went, I, I, I kept thinking, I gotta, 
change my friends and change what I'm doing and, and leave. So he would leave cities. He would leave everywhere. Everywhere he was, he would end up finding trouble and he would get it locked up. And as soon as he got out, he would move. <clears throat> he said, it wasn't until later in, in life I realized I kept getting in trouble everywhere I went. Because everywhere I went, there I was. You see, it wasn't until he gave his life to Christ and he realized that he was the sinner responsible for his sin that his life radically changed. And I was a young man when he shared that story with me and, I, and it impacted me for, to this day, forever. Because I thought, whoa, <laughs> it's me. You see, because society teaches somebody like me, a, a Mexican kid with immigrant parents, grew up with a single mom, grew up with learning disabilities. See, society teaches that, you know, I should be a loser and I should be mooching off the government. I should be a government dependent for my whole life because, oh, well, you know, he's a dumb little Mexican kid, obviously. He needs daddy welfare or daddy government to take care of him forever. Or, oh, well, he's angry because of this. Or, oh, well, he, he gets triggered because, no, it's all nonsense. We need to mature, yeah? We need to get past blaming other people for how we feel or for our defects or for the lack of maturity that's in us. And, and, and I pray, <clears throat> as it was James's heart for the believers, we need to mature. How do we mature? Well, by allowing God to bring victory in our lives through trial. So James chapter 1 is pretty much split in half. The first part of the chapter is dealing with external attacks, which is trials, difficulties, trouble that sometimes comes toward us or is around us, it's life. These troubles, they come and they can bring us down and they can smash us and that's real. The other part of the chapter is dealing with internal attacks, which are temptations, sin, right? Uh, today, we only have enough time to cover one. So we're gonna be looking at how to deal and how to navigate through trials, again, turning trials into triumphs in our life, not becoming victims because of our trials, not rolling over and just woe is me because of our trials, but understanding that this is hard, this is painful, this can be debilitating, but God is real and he is stronger and he is able and he can lift me up and he can actually strengthen me through this. This can actually make me better and stronger so that God willing someday when I'm a parent, <clears throat> I can instill that strength in my kids. I'm a grandparent and they can see grandma and grandpa how they're rock solid in Christ. They're immovable. But I understand and you understand that doesn't, that kind of strength and depth doesn't come overnight. It comes with time and it comes through the grind, through the process, through the pain. <clears throat> Joseph is probably um, the greatest example of this in the Bible. Joseph was loved by his dad, hated by his brothers. His brothers hated him so much they tried to kill him. One of the brothers said, nah, let's not kill him. Let's make money off of him and sell him as a slave. So he served as a slave faithfully. He was falsely accu accused, thrown in prison. While in prison, he was a faithful prisoner. <laughs> if you can say that. <clears throat> he was elevated in prison. Then he was recommended to serve the king. And while serving the king, he was elevated again and basically became the second in charge next to the king. 
he ended up governing and ruling everything. When it was time for him to have payback and vengeance on his brothers, when the drama had built up so much so that it was like a telenovela, it was ready. It was time for someone to get slapped. Joseph, because of the process, he chooses forgiveness. That, that's a miracle. He chooses forgiveness. Let's look at Genesis 50, verse 18 through 21. You can keep your finger in James. We'll come back. Genesis 50, verse 18, it says, Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. So it was time. Now he's in charge. His brothers are coming there to get uh, to buy grain and to collect food and sustenance for the family because there was a drought everywhere and a famine. Only Egypt had provisions because of Joseph's wisdom that God gave him. And Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am I in the place of God. But as for you, here's a reality. You meant what you did against me. You meant it against me as evil. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this day. God had a greater plan, a plan that I couldn't see, a plan that I didn't understand. But man, now I'm here and I can see. Where was he? He was on the back side, on the other side of the through process. In faith, as he started this, in faith, as he was thrown into the pit, he had to make a choice to either trust God or crumble and blame everybody else for his woes. Oh, it's because of this. Oh, it's because of that. Oh, it's because of my mom. Oh, it's because of my dad. Oh, it's because of my neighbor. Oh, it's because of the teacher. Oh, it's because of the president. What are you doing? And what's God doing in you? Will you have a testimony on the back end of this trial? <clears throat> because Joseph was there and he said, God did this to save us all. Now, therefore, verse 21, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. That's a beautiful story. You can go back and read it on your own. But we see it perfectly playing out in Joseph's life. <clears throat> There's another person, not a Bible character. The saying that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Now you could say that that's a good example or a good lesson to learn from Joseph's life, right? And that always gets me wondering. I have thoughts in my head. And I think, where does that come from? Where did that come from? So I looked it up. In 1915, Albert Hubbard wrote an obituary for a dwarf actor named Marshall P. Wilder. I have a picture of Marshall P. You get that up there? There he is. Here's what's cool about this man. He was a dwarf actor in the 1900s, the early 1900s. Let me just say, let me continue here. The obituary entitled, The King of the Jesters Praises Wilder's Optimistic Attitude and Achievements in the Face of His Disability, especially back then. He was a walking refutation of that dogmatic statement that says, Mens sana in corpo sano. What does that mean? It's Latin for a healthy mind is a healthy body. Well, he says this was a refutation, his life. His was a sound mind in an unsound body. It's like in your face. <laughs> 
He proved the eternal paradox of things. He cashed in on his disabilities. He picked up the lemons that fate had sent, his, uh, sent him and started a lemonade stand. That's the actual phrase. Life was throwing lemons at him. He picked them up and started a lemonade stand and made some money out of it. Made a living for himself. Marshall P. Wilder, he refused to give in to his limitations and his disability. He himself received offers from a bunch of circus acts. J.P. Barnum being one of the circus acts that pursued him, wanting to get him to come and be one of their clowns. Why? Well, I'm a Mexican from a single parent home. I should still be collecting government cheese and doing nothing with my life. Well, he was a little person. Oh, obviously, Sammy, he should be a clown in a circus. But I love his story because he said no. He broke through and became a legitimate on-stage actor. He broke through and actually made some films. He broke through the expectations, the limitations, and the disability that he had, and he said, no. I'm not going to roll over and die and suffer I'm not going to accept this mentality of being a victim. I'm going to do something. I'm going to be on the big screen. I'm going to be on the big stage. I'm going to be a regular person, and I'm going to do my best at it. I think his story is really cool. I don't know who he was in, in faith, I do not know if that man was a believer. But I'm challenged by his attitude, his perspective, and his outlook. And, and, and I think, how much more me as a believer, how much more you as a believer, who we know that God is at work in our lives, how much more can we face whatever life throws our way and say, yeah, we're going to get through it. Isn't it sad that maybe an unbeliever has a better perspective than you? And you know better. You know God is at work. The trials that we face have the capacity to either make us bitter or better. Bill Osborne, uh, he's a missionary in Hungary now pivotal in my life as a young man growing up without a father, growing up without spiritual examples and role models. Um, some of you know Bill. He's an awesome guy. And he, he shared this with me. I was probably about 16. Because see, when I came to Christ at 15, I, it was just, everything was new. And learning things like where I go, there I am. <laughs> maybe I'm the problem, so things need to change. Critical. Learning things like, yeah, life is tough, and it's going to either make me bitter or better. Pivotal. How long have you been a Christian? Have you seen God bring you through trials? Have you seen God take the lemons that life has been slapping you in the face with, have you stopped crying about the lemons hitting you? Have you started picking them up and owning it and making something worthwhile from it? Are you bearing fruit in your life? Are the people around you being shaded by the growth in your life? Are the people around you being nurtured and fed by the fruit in your life? Or are you still whining and crying about the woes of life?
James chapter 1. Verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. This sounds like nonsense. But I love how James writes this. He says, Count it all joy when you fall into, but go to the bank with it, write it down, log it. This can produce joy. So, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any or if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the winds. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. (laughs) uh, Your life is messed up, but hey, it can only get better. That's a great biblical concept. But the rich in his humiliation. If you're a rich, prosperous believer and you lose it all, glory in the fact that God's humbling you for a season. Well, that's not the American dream. Yeah. Life though, you know, it happens to us. Can you glory in it? Can you glorify God in the riches? When God lifts you up, can you glorify God in the riches? And when those riches are gone, can you glorify God in that? We don't want to be like the old school Charger fans in San Diego, man. (laughs) Chargers go to Super Bowl! Everybody's on the bandwagon. They lose one game and everybody's burning the bandwagon. It's just like from one day to the next. Ah, man, let's not do that. <laughs> hey, don't, re- don't suppose that you'll receive anything. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation with the rich in his humiliation because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. Man, we are just here for a moment. So here are some four words that we're gonna look at that are powerful here in this passage. First one is count. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Having a joyful attitude. It's been said that outlook determines outcome and attitude determines action. I would say that's true. We can crumble or we can rise. And it's, it's really how we're looking at the situation. You're looking at the trial with already an outcome in mind. God's going to bring the victory. There are a lot of things I don't understand about my life. There are a lot of things that I don't see. I don't have answers for. I don't know what God is doing in a week from now or in a month from now. I don't know how God is going to exactly solve the problems that I'm facing today. There's a problem in my life today, I was sharing with the kids in the youth group four months ago, there's this problem in my life. It's a real big issue. It's adult problems. I don't know how God's going to solve it, but I told them all with confidence, listen, there will come a time. I don't know if it's four months, three months, two months, or two years from now, but we're going to all be able to go back and see how God came through, how God did it. And God's going to do it. God's doing little baby steps, but he's going to do it. It'll be a settled issue. It'll be a non-factor in my life. But right now, it's a problem. But guess what? God's at work. I can count it as joy. I can bank on it because of who God is. 
Trials are inevitable. In John chapter 15, 33, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We are going to struggle in this world, but the victory is ours. We serve and follow a powerful, victorious king, the creator of all things. Whatever you're facing, it's not a big deal to him. It is not a problem. The only question is, it, the question isn't, can God do this? Will God do this? No. The question is, can you go through the, pro the process? Or will you bail out? Will you run from the process? You can go through it, and, and God will bring victory in your life. Or you can run away from it. It's, it's how we approach the problem. Number two, we are told here, knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. There is an understanding mind in this process. One, we're just banking on God has to do something. Number two, I know that God is gonna do it. Why is that different? Because one is faith the other one is a confidence. There's, a, there's an established knowledge. How do we grow or how do we have um, an established knowledge of something we don't know? My youth pastor taught me years and years ago when I was a youth. He said, God's past faithfulness demands my present trust in him. That's how we know, you see. Where does that past faithfulness come from? I'm gonna blow your mind right now. It comes from past trials that God saw you through. You see, if I learned God's past faithfulness in trials in my life, my present, I can bank on the fact that God did it in the past, he's gonna do it again. If I had a trial in the past, and I grabbed on to man's help, if I grabbed on to man's philosophy, oh, well, you see, Sammy, your problem is deep down rooted in the fact that, you know, you didn't have enough teddy bears in your room when you were growing up. Oh, that's why. Uh, no, man. Here's reality. Life is hard. Sometimes that hard life just comes and kicks your door down. And it's your turn. It's got nothing to do with how many teddy bears you had at home or how many Care Bears your mom bought you. We couldn't afford Care Bears. My mom didn't buy me Care Bears. I liked Care Bears. I didn't get them. Psychologists would say, oh, well, that explains a lot, Sammy. <laughs> a believer would say, that's sad, but move on. <laughs> it's not a big of a deal. It's not a life-changing event. Because as painful as that was, not having Care Bears, God saw you through it. God's gonna see you through the next thing. And when you face something big, scary, ugly, that threatens you or your family or your grandkids, it's something that's threatening big time, you can go back to the little things and say, I survived not having my own Care Bear. I, I also survived not having a TV in my room. And I survived, and, and you know, all of these woes and sorrows that we go through and survive, God's past faithfulness demands my present trust. It just, it becomes a fact. I don't know how, but it is a fact. God's gonna do it. 
That's what we learn as we go through it. In Romans 8, 28, and we know, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It's a fact. We know this. Moving on. Third, let. Verse four starts with a but. Count it, know it. God's gonna do it. But let patience have its perfect work. So we have to surrender to the process. We have to surrender to God's will and allow God to do it. And as we're allowing the process to happen, we have to yield a lot. We have to give a lot, a lot of control. My natural inkling is when faced with a problem, like I'm gonna solve it right now. Like there's a wall, let's blow it up. You know, well, we don't have, let's climb it. Well, we can't, well, let's go under it. I mean, it, you give me enough time, I will do it. The hardest thing for me is to let, <laughs> to just let patience have its work. And so instead of showing up two minutes later with dynamite, shovels, and a ladder, I'm just saying, what's God doing in my life right now? What is God wanting to show me? Or... What is God wanting to show the people around me? What does God want to show? See, I'm at the stage in life now that when I'm faced with a problem, when my wife and I are faced with a problem, the lesson now might not necessarily be for us. It's probably for my kids. Now that they're adults and they're not, you know, clueless children and dumb teenagers, now they're adults. Now they get to see, what, what are you guys doing about your problem? Oh, God's gonna work it out. They're like, what? You know, because they've seen dad, you know, blow up walls, dig under them and climb them. As far as they're concerned, right? I'm still Superman. No, not anymore. <laughs> as far as they're concerned, man, I'm gonna fix it, solve it, go around it, whatever. But now they get to learn like, oh, well, hey, guess what? Some problems we yield to and we have to let God be God. First Timothy six, it says, now godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Have you allowed God to show himself strong on your behalf through the trial? Some of you might be facing really hard trials right now. I'm hoping that as you came in today, just kind of like, well, I don't know what God's gonna do. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm hoping that maybe this was an encouragement to you. Some of you, again, this is just reality. Um, you're immature. And even as we've been talking about all of this, you're still in the back of your mind, like, yeah, well, Pastor Sammy, it's because you don't understand my situation, you see. My dog bit my toe when I was little. And that's why I can't hold a job, you know, because Mrs. Fluffy bit my toe. And that's why I have to quit my job, because my boss doesn't like, no. Stop. Stop the habit of whining and complaining about your issues and pushing it on everybody else and every other reason. And just stop and say, God, what can I learn today? You're never too old to start learning. 
And so maybe five years from now, you can mature past these walls that bring you down all the time. And you can say, Sammy looked at me weird the other day. It's because he hates me. It's because he's plotting against me. Or, just maybe, I just didn't see you. Is that possible? Yeah. I probably didn't see you. If I did see you, I would have said hi. Even if I didn't have time to stop and hug it out and talk about everything, I would have at least been like, hey. But to immediately assume that I'm out to get you, plotting against you, I probably called your boss that morning and told him what you were doing. See, all of that is now, that's just outrageous. That's novella drama. I grew up watching novelas with my mom. I am man enough to admit it. I enjoyed them. A lot of drama. A lot of drama. And it kind of helps me understand, like, why some people immediately assume drama into everything. I mean, you just got to, like, slow down. They're not plotting against you. Federico isn't going to come out and break into your car, you know. It's... Sometimes we are, his, we're just in a broken world with broken people and we hurt each other. Why? Because we're broken. There's not a plot against you personally. Even if it is, God's gonna see you through it. Right? He can't. Will you allow him to? Will you let him do it? Will you surrender to God's will in the pain and the struggle? Number four, ask. Verse five there says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Here's the thing. God does not expect you to have it all together. God does not expect you to know what's going on immediately when you're going through a struggle. God is not disappointed I may be disappointed in you, okay, honestly. I might just think like, man, you're way too old to be thinking this drama and nonsense. <laughs> but the exciting thing is, is that God isn't disappointed in you. He understands you. He knows what's going on with you. He knows how many times you ducked and hid and ran from trials and he knows that this is the first trial you are learning to endure. And man, he is so full of grace and patience for you. And he is ready and willing to hold your hand and walk you through the fire. He knows that. And so when you're struggling and you don't know that, you can pray. You can ask God, God, help me see what's going on. <laughs> Just, Lord, can you show me just a glimpse of how this is going to end so I can be a little bit encouraged? And he'll, he'll do that. He'll step in for you on that. Finally, it's not one of our words, but I don't know. It's my word, I guess. Don't be a quitter. Don't quit. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You can go to the bank on that. That is a fact. But we can run. We can quit. And we miss out on the growth. We do. In Galatians 6, verse 9, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. You know what quitters get? Nothing. 
you get nothing. But even if we're suffering, scared, overwhelmed, full of tears and anxiety as we're going through the fire, man, at the end of it, we get to see the victory. At the end of it, people around us get to see that victory in our lives. At the end of it, we can look now, we have an anchor point that when the next difficulty comes, we can look back and say, God saw me through that and that and that and that. And now here I am faced with the giant of a trial and while everyone else is gasping, <gasps> what are you gonna do? God's gonna do something. But what are you gonna do? Try to stay out of the way. And trust and bank on what I know. And when I'm doubting, pray that God gives me wisdom and just not quit. Because the struggle is it's in due season. <laughs> when is he gonna do it? That's the hard part. I don't know. But when he does it, it'll be good. It'll be solid. It'll be worth the wait. Can we endure? I hope so. I hope also that you know you have people around you that can help you endure. You can share that, hey, listen, I'm struggling. I want to quit. Pray with me that God would help me endure. Yeah? Let's pray, guys. Lord, we thank you for this day uh, as we're getting ready for Thanksgiving. God, I pray that our minds would start now um, adopting the lack, adopting the things that are missing, embracing the fear and just saying, I will be thankful for this thing when the time is right. God will be faithful now to me in this as he has been faithful in the past. And we thank you, God, that you've given us scripture that has shown us your past faithfulness that we can grab onto. And we thank you, Lord, for the trials. We do want to be those mature believers that can count it all joy when we face trials. We are human. We do get scared, worried, anxious. We do become overwhelmed in the face of adversity. But Lord, in the same sense, you are able to rise, to raise us up. And we can rise above. So Lord, we put our lives in your hands. We're grateful for the process. We're grateful for the pain the struggle and the fear, knowing that you will make us stronger and that you will establish our faith even more through the process. Do that work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, we have a team outside that wants to bless you with some amazing food. So don't run away, hang out, fellowship with each other, get to know each other, meet some new people. Have a great week.